Hi, everybody. Uh, so I uh, I am uh, a member of the LIGO collaboration or the LIGO Virgo CAGRA collaboration, and I'm one of those pesky users who comes and uh, <laughs> uses. <laughs> um, so I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about uh, perfect. Thanks. Um, talk a little bit about uh, you know, some of the science that I'm doing, uh, you know, with the resources that you guys make available. Um, uh, I admit I went a little bit logo happy with the, the title slide, but uh, I'm a member of a lot of uh, groups. Um, anyway, so uh, last year, as uh, was mentioned earlier, I, um, uh, I had the opportunity to go and be part of the, uh, the OST user school, um, where I learned a lot of Wait, Sorry. Where I learned a lot of the uh, the tools of the trade for how to do uh, high throughput computing, a lot you know how to interact with Condor and run jobs on a cluster, things like that, um, which is commonplace in the the LIGO collaboration. And I took that knowledge back to my research, started working on making our workloads more efficient, how to you know improve our uh, our throughput to get the most out of the resources that uh, that we have available to us. Um, so here's a you know sort of an overview of the uh, of the the talk. So basically. I help detect gravitational waves from uh, astrophysical sources. So, you know, if here's a uh, uh, an artist's rendition of two neutron stars uh, merging. Um, uh, if you're not familiar with how gravitational waves work, can work. Do uh, data analysis in order to actually find the signals from these uh, these compact binary coalescences. Um, and the nature of this work requires high throughput computing. It's just there's um, a huge number of computations that have to be done. Um, and so, as I said, my goal is to improve uh, our throughput on these clusters so that we can do more science. We can search for more waveforms. We can make more discoveries. Um, so let me talk a little bit first about gravitational waves themselves. Um, so uh, this picture is objects in the universe. So black holes and neutron stars are the two most dense objects in the universe. And uh, general relativity predicts that if you have very dense objects that are accelerating, like, you know, as they do when they collide together, when they merge, they come into this spiral dance um, right before they, uh, they actually collide, uh, that produces gravitational waves, which are ripples in space-time itself. Uh, that have very, very subtle effects on uh, time and space as they uh, travel through the universe. So as those waves reach the Earth, um, we can, in principle, detect those. It's just very, very hard to do so. Uh, so the, uh, the LIGO collaboration initially uh, set out to build observatories that we could use to detect those. So here are some pictures of them. Um, these are the three that are currently operating in the current um, LVK uh, observing run called O4. Um, these uh, are you know, located around the, the uh, Earth. We have two in the United States, one in Louisiana and one in Washington. Um, and then there's a third one that's in Italy that is observing. Um, and another one, in Cat another one called Kagra in Japan um, that is not currently observing. They were hit with an earthquake, so they're... <laughs> fixing things. <laughs> um, but uh, these observatories are really uh, engineering marvels. Um, we are detecting um, over the, the length of these, um, the, the tunnels in these observ observatories, uh, which are kilometers long. We're trying to measure a change in distance that is less than the width of a proton. Um, so incredibly sensitive instruments. Um, and so, you know, we use things like seismic isolation. We have the, these kilometers of tunnels are pumped down in vacuum, cryogenic cooling on the mirrors just to get the temperature down because temperature is vibration and we're sensitive to that. Um, uh, I don't really work on the engineering side of things, but it's truly an engineering marvel. So I wanted to include that. Um, uh, so as I mentioned, there, you know, there are several observatories located around the world. More observatories means uh, we are more sensitive because um, each observatory has you know, various sources of noise, and then uh, if you have more observatories, then you can compare the signals between observatories, and you can be more confident that what you saw is actually detection instead of noise. Um, so now if you'll give me a moment, I'm going to try and screen share from my shirt. Here is, <laughs> uh, here is the waveform of the first gravitational wave detection uh, in 2015. Um, so here's just sort of uh, to give you an idea of what these signals look like. When the, when the gravitational waves pass through the Earth, um, they uh, cause an interference pattern in the lasers that go down these perpendicular arms of the observatories. And we get out um, a measure of, uh, that we call strain, which is a measure of the change in length uh, of, the of the observatory arms divided by the length of the observatory arms. Um, but basically, it's a measure of how much the space has been stretched. 
Um, and so as these, uh, these binaries orbit each other, uh, they produce this, you know, uh, this wave uh, that comes through where space is stretched and squished and stretched and squished. Um, and I'm going to try something. I'm going to see if I can get a uh, cool YouTube video to play here. Um, don't remember things. Um, it's a little bit of a gamble, but if it works, it's very cool. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> I don't know why I didn't see that coming. Okay, so here we have two black holes. This is a, a simulation of that first uh, detection. Um, and uh, all right, we'll just play in the small window. Sorry about that. Uh, so this is a simulation of, of uh, that first detection. You can see two black holes orbiting each other. Um, and as they do, these gravitational waves go outward rippling outward, and notice that the frequency and the amplitude are increasing in this uh, characteristic uh, chirp that we call it. Um, as the, the amplitude increases, you can see the waveform at the bottom. Uh, the amplitude increases and the frequency increases, and that's how we can pick the, the signal out of the data. That's what we're looking for in the data. Um, and so what we do, which is much more efficient than just looking for any um, anything that might be astrophysical in origin is if we know what we're looking for, then we can look specifically for those waveforms. So we pre compute, just hold this, uh, uh, we pre compute um, the, you know, what general relativity predicts the waveform should look like for. Um, a bunch of uh, a bunch of different parameters, so sets of parameters, so different masses of of uh, black holes and neutron stars, different spins, um, you know, orientations, distances, things like that. Um, so we we vary these parameters and we we come up with these waveforms, um, and then we feed those waveforms into a data analysis pipeline. Uh, that um, the one that I work on is called GST Lao. Um, which is an acronym of an acronym of an acronym. Don't worry about it. <laughs> um, uh, so uh, GSTL searches for these pre-computed waveforms. Um, and it because we know what the signal should look like, we can actually pull the signals out of uh, really noisy data. Because as I said, the signals are very, very weak. Uh, the effects are very, very small. Um, so uh, naturally, we're, we're always dealing with the, the noise in the detectors. Um, so here's... Uh, some some plots that show a little bit um, about how we do that. So uh, down here at the bottom, you can see um, the in the the colored plots here are the actual data that came out of the observatory. So we have three here that we're we're on. Um, this is the first detection that was um, uh, detected by three observatories. So um, the Hanford and Livingston uh, LIGO observatories, and then the Virgo uh, detector in Italy. Um, and so you can see the in color the the data from these three observatories um, is very noisy. Um, it's kind of all over the place. Um, and then overlaid on top of that in black is the simulated waveform uh, that we expect from this signal. So this is the um, the best match uh, template that uh, that matched up with the uh, the data. And um, as so, basically, what our uh, our pipeline is doing is it's taking these pre-computed waveforms and it's sliding it along the the data and looking to see how well does the data match that waveform, and we do that with millions of waveforms, <laughs> um, and which is why high throughput computing comes into play. <laughs> uh, you can't do that on a laptop, um, uh, and so as we slide these waveforms along, the better the match, the better the signal to noise ratio, which is primarily what we're concerned with, and that plot is up at the top. Uh, where you can see that in the Livingston Observatory, we had the, the best match with the template. It was a very loud signal. Um, uh, you can also see it very well in, in this uh, middle row, which is frequency on the vertical axis, time on the horizontal axis. So um, you can see the energy at each frequency as the, uh, as the objects get closer together, the frequency increases so that you get this characteristic chirp sound. Um, and if you play that uh, as an audio 
like you can convert this to an MP3 file and play, and it goes, whoop, which is <laughs> my notification tone when we get an event. <laughs> um, um, so anyway, so we see this uh, very loudly in Livingston, uh, a little bit weaker in Hanford, um, even quieter in Virgo. You can see it's a little bit more buried in the noise, um, but because we're doing this trick where we compute the signal to noise ratio, we can see there is uh, a very clear bump in the, uh, uh, in the signal to noise ratio plot for, for Virgo up here. Um, so that's how we, uh, um, how we find an event, right? So um, now we've been doing this for, we, the, the collaborations that I'm a part of uh, have been doing this for um, a handful of years now. 2015, again, was the first detection. Um, and since then, uh, we have found quite a lot of events. Um, and this is really the, um, the newest form of astronomy <laughs> um, because we have a whole new way of observing the universe through gravitational waves. Um, and so this is everything that humanity has ever seen through gravitational waves and then a bunch of things that we've seen through um, uh, electromagnetic, um, you know, more traditional astronomy. Um, so the, the horizontal axis here is meaningless. This is just a, um, a nice way to represent it. But the vertical axis is the masses of these objects uh, in solar masses, being the mass of the sun, <laughs> um, which is a nice unit for most, uh, most of the things that we do. Um, and you can see there are, there are a lot of black holes that started uh, around 30 solar masses, and then they combine together, and they become a, one larger black hole at the end. Um, uh, so this is sort of the the state of gravitational wave astronomy <laughs> um, as of a little over a year ago, because in this plot is not included um, the data from the current observing run, where we have more or less doubled the number of events in the last year, uh, because every time we turn the detectors on, um, let me say it the other way. Every time we turn the detectors off, we make them more sensitive. And then every time they come back on, we can see a lot more than we could when we turn them off. So um, that's why we do these observing runs. Um, uh, and this, I'm sure, is uh, um, part of the reason that uh, LIGO usage of uh, the OS pool and OSDF increased so dramatically in the last year is a little over a year ago, we started this observing run. So there's, there's your production usage right there. Um, so uh, let's, uh, let's change gears a little bit um, and talk about how this looks on a cluster, since this is high throughput computing. <laughs> um, so we use, uh, we use Condor to manage all of our jobs. Um, and uh, we have the, the LIGO Virgo CAGRA collaboration has a handful of computing centers that we use. Um, but we also use the OS pool. Um, and we have sort of a subset of the OS pool called the Igwin, uh, the Igwin pool that we utilize quite a lot of, and I would like to use more of. Um, but anyway, so our analysis is organized into a bunch of jobs as a directed acyclic graph. And so we use you know, Condor's Dagman. Um, and uh, um, the, the general structure here, uh, you can see, you know, we have to estimate the noise in the detector. Uh, this is for an archival search. So you can conveniently look at all of the data that you wanna analyze. You can estimate the noise over the whole thing. You can see the future essentially. <laughs> uh, for real-time analysis, you can't see the future. It's a little bit more complicated uh, if I were to make a graph of that, but, um, uh, but we also do real-time detection. But for, for an offline analysis, we call it an archival search of the data. We can estimate the noise, then we can use that uh, to help us prepare the waveforms for the jobs that will actually do the, the searching of the data. Um, you know, in the most computationally efficient way that we can. Um, and then we feed all of that information into our, uh, our jobs that do the actual search that are, you know, computing the SNR. Um, um, and uh, we have a lot of those. Uh, so for a, uh, analyzing a, about a week of data or about 2 million waveforms, we're talking about a scale of about 100,000 jobs. Um, so that's, you know, certainly enough to justify <laughs> using the OS pool. <laughs> um, uh, uh, and I have some, you know, the, the specs of a typical job up here. Um, but my goal here is to improve our throughput. So um, I'm taking the skills that I learned at the OSG school last year. Um, and what I would like to do is um, 
basically, if, if I can improve our throughput, we can search for more waveforms. Uh, so not just more waveforms, but more types of waveforms. So different, different kinds of uh, cosmic events uh, give us different types of waveforms, and we are limited in the number that we can search for by the computing resources that we have available. So what we want to do is expand to running on the, uh, in the OS pool, um, uh, and uh, specific, mostly the, uh, the IGWIN pool, but also the, the public OSG. Um, um, and doing that would give us a lot more computing resources, so then more waveforms, more discoveries, uh, cool science. <laughs> uh, the biggest challenge that we run into, though, is the number and the size of the network transfers that we'd have to do um, running in a distributed uh, high throughput computing environment. Um, and as has been discussed uh, a lot already today, that problem is solved <laughs> by uh, the OSDF, which is wonderful. Um, and my current project, what I'm working on, is um, breaking some of the underlying assumptions of our, uh, of our workflows to allow us to use those caches, because right now, um, there were, when our workflows were being designed, this, the OSDF wasn't, uh, wasn't available yet, so we couldn't plan for that. <laughs> um, but that's the future, basically, is, uh, for us, is to uh, start using the OSDF. Um, um, and, uh, you know, small tests so far have, have worked wonderfully. Uh, the throughput is amazing, and I'm really excited for it. <laughs> um, uh, I did want so, to... Uh, before you, you move on, how many jobs do you expect these DAGs to be? Um, so, as I said, a, a week of data uh, represents about 100,000 jobs. Um, so, over you know, uh, for half an observing run, um, you know, we're a few million jobs, basically, you know, uh, millions of jobs. But uh, these aren't millions of jobs that would run for, you know, days. No, no, it, 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 it just... But, uh, yes, it's it, a lot it just, of jobs, yes. It, it, it just uh, several million jobs yes. for, for this project. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, so this would be um, for our production uh, analyses going forward. Yeah, but you, you this, want to go the archival search, no? Uh, okay. Yes. Well, so we have, there's two kinds of production analysis. There's the low latency analysis, which maybe is what you're thinking of, which is sort of a real-time search, where as the data comes out of the observatories, we're filtering that. Um, this would be the archival search, which um, we have to do for every observing run. Um, it gets broken into um, two chunks, although this one is looking to be three. Um, um, where it would be, you know, say 13, 13 to 15, something like that, um, you know, weeks. Um, so then, you know, five, 10 million jobs, something like that. Um, but that would only be for uh, six months or something like that. You know, over six months, there's five or 10 million jobs. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, um, so, uh, so that's that's what I'm working on. <laughs> that's the future, and I and I hope that next year, <laughs> um, when uh, when you get to see all the Excel spreadsheets of OSDF usage, <laughs> that uh, I contribute to that spike. <laughs> um, but um, since I'm you know fairly new to the world of high throughput computing, as I said, I was a you know attendee of the OSG user school last year. Uh, I learned a couple things over the last year, and so I just wanted to. Um, say a few things to new users. I don't know if there are new users here, um, but uh, uh, here are a couple tips. Um, don't wait on computers. There are a lot of computers. <laughs> uh, so try and find a way to make it so that your, you know, your ability to come up with new uh, scientific questions is the bottleneck. Uh, containerize your software. <laughs> um, moving files can be complicated. Uh, I apologize, I've used the word files. I will say moving objects can be complicated. <laughs> um, uh, so plan for that early, uh, think it through. Um, the OSDF is wonderful. Um, uh, and uh, bookmark the Condor Submit documentation. Just, just do it. <laughs> anyway, uh, thank you very much. <laughs>